sure. Okay, it is now recording. Right. Welcome to the aquatic session. Uh, we're recording for you and we'll just be talking general overview and hopefully it will help you. We have been told that you should have watched a video on the association's website prior to our meeting tonight. So hopefully you've done that. And there should have been a link to general topics that you can cover in the aquatic session. The aquatic session is very broad and there's a lot of detail for you to study. So it might be a little hard for you, but we're just gonna to touch on a few of the highlights this afternoon to give you an idea of what to reference. Ruth, do you want to start with the macroinvertebrates? Yes, definitely. Um, make sure that you review your macroinvertebrates. You need to be familiar with both um, biological sampling techniques, which would be the macroinvertebrates, and the um, chemical and physical sampling techniques of any waterway. Those are very important. Uh, you can almost be guaranteed to have some um, quiz questions on those. So know what stage one taxa are, stage two taxa, stage three taxa. Um, be familiar with being able to identify what is a mayfly, what is a stonefly. Uh, what's the difference between the gilled snail and the lung snail? Which one goes in um, which taxa? You know, which one do you hope to see when you're sampling? Um, the macroinvertebrates, of course, are a um, way that you can tell based on what you're finding in the waterway. Um, they're not, you know, super, super specific, but they give you a good feel for the stream health. And so you're looking, you're hoping to find a lot of the group one uh, taxonomy critters. Those are your... Uh, things like your mayflies and your stoneflies and your caddisflies, the things that need good quality water, lots of oxygen in the water, that type of thing. And those are what Kelly's scrolling through right now. Uh, when you start looking at some of your group two, your dragonflies, your damselflies, um, your, some of your, your other um, critters that you may find, that is a moderate level of uh, water quality. And then in your group three, where you start to see some of the aquatic worms and uh, some of the leeches and different things like that, that's where you have an indicator that there may be poor water quality, but, and this is something you need to pay attention to, if you get a question like, um, if you see an aquatic worm, does that automatically mean you have poor water quality? The answer is no, because those critters that live in poor quality water can also thrive in excellent quality water. You will find them in both types of water. What you won't find, however, is um, the critters that only live in good quality water will not be found in poor quality water. So it's not so much did you find it as much as it is how much of each group did you find that indicate your water quality. So if you don't know that, brush up on that. Also be familiar with the chemical tests, what they test for, how they're done. Familiarize yourself with turbidity. Know what a secchi disc is. Um, all of those types of things are things that you may run across as you're taking your quiz. Are there any questions about that? I'm scrolling right now. You should be able to see some water sampling equipment, just as an example. This is a Hess sampler for collecting microinvertebrates from shallow waters. This is your same net. And then here is your second disc. Some other things, and I don't know if I'm going out of order, Kelly. 
Um, something else you really want to review uh, are the watersheds in Virginia. Um, take, uh, take out a watershed map, quiz yourself, you know, what is this watershed? What's this river? Um, make sure you're familiar with those as well. I'll share that on the screen now for you. Please do. Yeah, also know what states make up the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, you know, know the major watersheds. Again, I can, I, and I haven't written this, I haven't seen it, I don't know what the test looks like, but I can almost guarantee you, you will have a question about these watersheds. A lot of your questions like this are going to be fill in the blank. You're going to need to have memorized the map and the layout. Mm -hmm. There may be also some random, just generic facts about the Chesapeake Bay itself. So there's a lot of criteria that you could look at. You need to know the definition of a watershed, not just the names of the ones in the state. Another topic that you may want to familiarize yourself with um, are wetlands. What is a wetland? How do you um, define a wetland? What are the things that must be present um, for something to be classified as a wetland. Along the lines of watershed talking, knowing how to delineate a watershed. Mm. What to look at in a topographic map. I'm gonna pull up a topographic map for you now. A topographic map is gonna show you the different elevations in a watershed. The lines that are closer together mean it's a steeper slope. You should be able to find your water bodies on a topographic map. Most often, if this is a question on your test, the judge is gonna ask you to look at a specific body of water. This topographic map on your screen, we would probably say find the lake that's in the middle and delineate the watershed to that lake. When you delineate a watershed, you're going to find the outlet of the water first. Most often on a pond, find your straight line that shows you where the dam is, where the impoundment is that's holding back the water. That's your can outlet. I, can I interrupt you, Kelly, for just a moment? Yes, can you make that bigger? Yes, I can. Looking at that, because I know me, myself, with my old eyes, I, can, I would have a very hard time delineating that watershed. Yeah. Is that... It gets a little blurry, but is that better? That's better. Okay. So you can see the lake here. You can see the straight line, the whiter color, which is your open land, which is going to be your dam. You can see the stream coming out of it. You can see streams coming into it and in the upper reaches of the lake. So you're going to look for high points because your water is going to drain from your high points to the low point, which is the body of water. Start with your outlet. Put an X on the map where your dam is, where your water's leaving the lake. And then follow around it and just look for elevations. This map is very blurry. So ones you might actually have in front of you, you should be able to read the numbers that might say 400 or 460 or 320. Look for the high numbers. Hills are usually a circle. There are smaller areas, so they show you where the high points are. Roads are a good way to figure out a high point. Most of your highways and secondary roads are going to be on a high ridge because that's where they would have driven the horse and buggies back in the old days. So if you're looking at this as a generic watershed, you can use these roads that are in black that are nearby to help you narrow down your focus but it's like connect the dots. You make a dot at your outlet, you make a dot at your high points, and then you connect them to figure out your watershed drainage area. Ruth, do you have anything else you wanna to add to that? I think that's good. Okay. This kind of question is gonna be very much as close as you can get it as far as your point system goes. Your judge is just hoping you understand the general concept. So don't freak out 
and stress over it too much. Do the best you can. All right, I'll stop sharing and find you something else to look at. While you're um, looking for the next thing, another topic that you should be familiar with are um, some of the common species, wildlife species you might find in or around the, the waterways themselves, but within the watersheds. Um, do a refresher on your freshwater fish. Um, figure out you know, your basic categories of fish for fish identification, parts of the fish, know, you know which one's the dorsal fin, which one's the, um, you know, where are the scales, where are the different things like that, be able to identify the parts of the fish. Um, not just fish, but other aquatic species. Um, familiarize yourself with um, some things you might find uh, in the bay or along the way to the bay, you know, sturgeon, oysters. Um, also, what's an invasive species that we are having problems with? And um, be able to determine what are invasives versus uh, native species. Aquatics has a wide range. You can start in depth in your stream beds. You can go all the way out to the bay. You can talk about your land use. This screen in front of you is just a picture to kind of show you a little bit of what all goes on with your water quality habitat. So you can see that nutrient sediment toxins going into the water change the layout of the, the lake itself, of the water itself. So those types of, de of, type of information is going to go into, you're going to start hearing words like non-point source pollution and point source pollution. Your top three um, points of pollution are going to be sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. When we start talking about um, best management practices or BMPs, we're talking about ways to that humans affect land use and how to reduce runoff into the waterways and reduce the entrance of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus and then sediment into the waters. I will see if I have, I think I have a article on some options of non-point source pollution and source po and point source pollution. So your non-point source pollution is pollution that you cannot follow it back to one specific point of origin. And an example of that would be sedimentation coming from erosion. Erosion can come from construction sites in many different locations. Erosion can come from crop fields in many different locations. You can also have um, pollution from livestock access to waterways, cattle, horses, drinking from a stream or a pond and defecating in the water, urinating in the water causes pollution that way. How many farmers with livestock do we have in the state of Virginia? We can't really point our finger at one of them and say he's the only one that's caused that pollution. So those types of pollution are gonna be considered non-point source. Point source pollution is gonna be considered when you can look at direct cause and say, there it is, it's coming from that particular outlet drain from a factory discharge or something else of that nature. On your screen is just a worksheet that has some quick bullet points of ideas of how to have, of which sources of nutrient, of pollution, and then which BMPs go with them. So you might have a question on your test that says, here's an example of something going on. How would you fix it? Name three BMPs to fix this problem. So you should know your background on those options. So for agricultural uh, pollution, 
you have different things. You, it says to read and follow all labels before using chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides. So a BMP for that is to apply as the directions say, don't over apply. Use conservation tillage, use contour farming. Those are things that you can do to reduce erosion on your farm. So you'll hear words like uh, buffer, riparian forest buffer. A riparian forest buffer is going to be an area between the bank of the water and whatever activity is going on. And it's going to have grasses and trees planted there to reduce the runoff, reduce the erosion, slow things down before it gets to the waterway. Ruth, do you have anything else you want to add to? Um, not so much related to that. Um, but it did remind me that you may get questions not just about surface water, but also about groundwater. Um, so you may need to be able to describe, you know, the definition of surface water, um, know, familiarize yourself with the water cycle. You know, um, the water may run along the surface or it may percolate down um, into the ground. It may just be held within the soil pores or it may um, become trapped in an aquifer. Uh, understand where the water table is. Kelly's put this map up here on the screen, um, how, to, how to look at a picture and identify that uh, water table, um, which is basically just the height to which the soil um, is fully saturated or you know the depth, I guess, not the height, which the um, where the soil becomes fully saturated below that point. Um, you may want to know a little bit about if someone were to drill a well and suck water out, that creates a cone of depression. Um, the soil itself will filter the water and clean the water. Uh, nevertheless, there can be sources of contamination in groundwater, um, just like there can be in surface water. Hmm. What else? Has any of this spurred any questions from you guys? Elise or Melissa, is there anything that no jumps out at you guys? No, no Any, questions. Anything you think we haven't covered yet? No, I think you're giving a great overview and giving good, good uh, suggestions for areas to, to be familiar with. Yeah, y'all have done great. The only thing I was going to mention was the groundwater thing because the, you know, going with the special topic and everything, I think that will probably, something like that will be in the test. But like I said, I think y'all have done a great job. It's hard to do a question and answer session with no questions. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else. Um, as far as chemical about. testing, what chemical tests should we expect to do if we were to test water for that part? We talked about the biological monitoring more you know, specifically with the macrovertebrates, but if we were to test chemical factors. We'd probably be testing for nitrogen. We'd be testing for phosphorus or phosphates. Um, we might be doing a um, testing for um, fecal contamination within the water, um, bacterial contamination within the water. We may be doing a pH test for, for sure, recognizing that most water um, is not going to be pure at 7% or, or, excuse me, at a pH of 7, which would be neutral. It's going to be slightly acidic in nature. Um, our water tends to be slightly acidic. Um, but, you know, the geology of the area is going to impact pH. 
the chemicals going into the water are going to affect pH. Um, there's a lot that um, can create differences in pH in your waterways. So Kelly just highlighted that most organisms require a pH between 5.5 and 9.5. Um, a lot of your amphibians, a lot of your fish, a lot of your um, smaller organisms that they feed upon. Of course, there are outliers who live beyond that range, but um, that's probably the typical range. Oh, dissolved oxygen, I didn't even think about that. That's a good one to know. And, and one thing you want to make sure that you're familiar with is that, that you're gonna have a higher dissolved oxygen content in colder water. As water warms up, the water molecules themselves um, are moving and jiggling and there's more space and they, the, the oxygen gets released. And um, so you're not gonna have as much oxygen in the warmer water as you are in the colder water, which is going to affect the organisms that you find in those temperatures. Okay. I'm trying to think what else, Kelly? I'm gonna scroll through this mm -hmm. worksheet and juggle, juggle our memory. <laughs> in a um, year where it's not virtual, you might actually be asked to conduct some of these tests. Of course, being virtual, you can't conduct the test, but you should definitely know, you know, know what the test is for, um, factors that influence what you're testing for, all of that. Salinity is a test that I often forget about because we don't, in Central Virginia where I'm from, we don't go out with our kids and do salinity tests. But as you get closer to saltwater areas, um, that becomes a more important test as you want to know um, how much salt uh, or what the salinity is of that water, especially in tidal areas and where you get some brackish water. Um, brackish water, of course, being a mixture of fresh water and salt water. And we talked about nitrate and phosphate. A lot of your nitrates and phosphates are going to come from um, fertilizers. Um, overuse of fertilizer, putting too much down or at the wrong time of the year. Um, lots of times agriculture gets blamed for the fertilizer excess, but um, both agriculture and homeowners trying to get those green lawns um, can impact that. And in fact, there's so many regulations on agriculture now and so many incentives. Um, that um, we're looking more and more towards homeowners for the source of that excess fertilizer. Animal waste, not just from um, say cattle or sheep or goats or, or farm animals, um, but surprisingly wildlife animal waste is something that we find a lot of when sampling um, out with DNA testing in the water as well. Um, that's something none of us have any control over. All right, I'll stop sharing right there. That was a lot of information on, you know, water quality testing and chemical monitoring, but it gives you a broad overview of what to expect on the different um, items that can affect your water quality, what we can look at to determine what's going on in that particular body of water in that particular watershed, and which BMPs to use to deter any more water quality degradation. Um, 
Another term that you might hear is a TMDL. This is a total daily load. This is the total amount of pollutant that a water body can handle before it surpasses the state's water quality standards. So the Department of Environmental Quality often develops MDL programs that are geared towards specific watersheds aiming to clean up whatever they have monitored in that particular water body. It could be fecal coliform, it could be uh, high nitrate, it could be high phosphorus. And then those BMPs are developed to target that, those specific issues. I feel like we've covered a lot for you. Aquatics is a very broad topic. So hopefully we've helped you pick and choose the highlights. I know that we're all here for questions and answers later. If you watch our video and then you need to reach out, please do so. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. <laughs> all right, I guess you could stop.